Hey, what? Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I once again have Robbie the Fire Bernstein on the horn, on the Skype horn. Uh, it is it is weird uh, doing these. It's weird. I recorded a, uh, a Legion of Skanks earlier um, with everybody on. You know, uh, we, we did it. We didn't do it on Skype. We did it on that um, Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which was good. Maybe we'll try doing one of our next episodes on there. I don't really know which one is better or worse, but uh, um, this one's easier. So I, I always opt for what's easy. But it's weird. It's weird to do these shows where you're used to sitting in a room with people uh, and now doing it over this. But you know what? Better than nothing. And uh, I'm thankful that we're still able to to put some stuff up. So, Rob, you have really, since we spoke last, made this hotel room your own. Um, <laughs> I like what you've done with the place. Yeah, I, uh, I repainted it. I brought in three full bookshelves <laughs> with books. I got some workout equipment. So, you know, I really, uh, I just want to make sure if I'm going to be, uh, you know, the end of the world somewhere, it, it's comfortable and it represents me well. <laughs> so where are you? You're up in Connecticut now? Yeah, and I'm not letting the maiden. I put that thing out there, so I don't care how many weeks I'm here for. I'm gonna stick to the same towels. I don't want them coming in here seeing what I did. Yeah, I'm being I'm being uh like super weird. The uh the mailman came earlier and like rang the bell, and I guess had a package that they needed me to sign for, and and I was like, just leave it, just just leave it. And they were like, oh, you need a sign. And I'm talking through the door with my baby in my arms, and I was like, now, <laughs> it's just like, I was like, now I'm not. I'm not opening the door right now. It's like I got the baby right here. Like I was letting my wife sleep in and I was up with the baby. It was early in the morning. You know, it was supposed to be at 745 or something like that. Like I don't know why the hell they're ringing the bell at 745. But I'm I'm just I'm the only one in the house that's up is me and the baby. And I was like, yeah, I got the baby in my arms. I'm not opening the door and having you come this close to us. So I was just like, ow, oh, no. And he didn't leave it. He took it with him. Really? But yeah, so that I was like, oh. That might be a thing every single day where he's like, you know, you guys are butting heads and he just wants to deliver it and you don't want to have to see him. I'd be like, dude, you can leave it there and then I'm going to fucking attack it with a Lysol bottle before I fucking touch it. I've uh, I've I've never been like I know you you've been a little bit more on the germaphobe side. I've never been like that. But now seeing this stuff and starting to hear about more and more people getting this virus. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Not messing around. <laughs> This this comment's going to bug people out, but here's what makes you a germaphobe. It's just once you realize that germs are a thing, once you just become aware of that there's a thing there and it could be detrimental to you, that's sticky. I became a germaphobe, sadly, I had a friend probably almost 10 years ago passed away from cancer. And just when we went over there, you had to Purell. And once you get into that habit, once it's in your head like, oh, there are germs on everything and they can get you sick, that doesn't go away. So everyone else can look forward to being a germaphobe for the rest of their lives. I've I've actually been thinking about that a lot recently, but what, like, because you start to think about things are getting so weird right now that you're like, how? What is the like realistic path back toward normal? Say, like, how? What's the best case scenario, or like, or, or a reasonable, case, you know, guess at when things will be normal again? And then I was thinking about like, I go, man, will people ever? Like, how long is this going to spook people into not wanting to shake hands, you know, like hug, I love that. you know, friends? I, 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 I'm wondering, I wrote this down as a joke premise. I got nothing on it yet. But like, how soon are we where I can start freaking out on people for bad, like germ etiquette? Because that's already like a little more normal. We're like in the past. I don't know if someone cough with that. Like you can't yell at them. But now the social etiquette's going to be where you can actually get annoyed at people for like being gross, which I love. I think that's yeah. Gonna be great. <laughs> yeah. I do, um, you know, I I know there's a lot of people, I might have mentioned this when we were talking last time, but there's a lot of uh, um, people in the libertarian space, and I guess just in the kind of like conspiracy space, who are saying that, you know, we're kind of giving in to the fear and that, you know, it's like, oh, this is no big thing. And they're just making, the, they're, they're overplaying this. I uh, I don't think they're right. I think this is the real deal in in. A sense. I mean, not that it's like going to destroy humanity, but this this does seem to be a real nasty virus. And I, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I actually know a few people now who have it uh, today. Um, as we record this, we're recording late on Monday. Um, so we missed our normal stream time. I apologize for that. But uh, we'll, we'll be up shortly after. Um, but it, this was the first day that I believe there were over 100 deaths 
in the United States of America. And it seems like that's just going to uh, we're still in the growing phase of that. There's a few problem. There, there's some misinformation that's out there or at least some information that's dubious that's being reported as if it's reality. And one of the things is that people go. So one of the um, the the data points that people were taking as like uh, somewhat of a positive sign was that they go, well, look, it only took this long in China for for it to break and to start to fall down. And the problem with that is that you're trusting the Chinese government's numbers. Right. And we have absolutely no idea whether the, these are e- even close to the reality of the situation. Right. So, I mean, maybe optimistically, maybe. But to just take that as fact, I mean, the Chinese government, I so I don't trust our government. I don't trust some people who are good friends of mine, but I definitely don't trust the Chinese government to be delivering the American people accurate statistics. So then you see these things where it's just like reported and the news just reports it as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, Italy has now overtaken China as the, you know, the biggest, you know, the epicenter of coronavirus. And you're like, but is that a fact? Is that actually accurate? Or is it just what the Chinese government is saying? Um, or what the Italian government's saying. I mean, we're just trusting foreign governments at this point, which isn't any wiser than trusting your own government. And then what really was crazy to me is that this was just the news that everyone was reporting was that New York is now the epicenter of the coronavirus. And that's just stated like a fact. Like, this is a fact. New York has more cases of the coronavirus than anywhere else. Until you start digging a little bit, like one centimeter under the surface, and you realize that actually New York has just done more testing than anybody else. That's it. It's it, and the ratio isn't even lined up. Almost funny because at first he was saying there's no reason to panic in New York. The only reason there's more cases here is because we've done more testing. And now he's completely flipped that to being, no, we need more resources than anybody else because he totally dropped that testing thing. He goes, the reason we need you to send all the supplies here is because we've got the biggest outbreak and the most people that have tested positive. And he's not mentioning the fact that they've tested more at all. He's playing, but he played both sides of that. No, he sure did. That was day one. He was like making that point hard, which I was thankful. I was actually kind of appreciating the fact that he was making that point and going, well, look, actually, we've tested more than twice as much as California and we don't have twice as many cases. So it's not so clear that we are the, you know, the epicenter. And then some people got in his ear and they were like, dude, there's no federal funds in saying that, you know. So uh, anyway. Anyway, hold on. Sorry, my kid's freaking out downstairs. That sounded like a joyous scream. No, not no, like, it wasn't. Uh, oh. Not so a was not a joyous know. scream. Unfortunately, let me make sure she's okay. Oh Jesus Christ! All right, just got so that unrelated, but just got some some not great news. Over uh, somebody else. I, I'm starting to hear about people who have it. People around. A couple of my wife's friends and uh, uh, stuff. And it's really freaking me out. Um, also, it looks like uh, Rand Paul. Rand, did you see that? Yeah. Now, here's what's insane about that. For whatever reason, whoever's sick is not able to vote on this. That makes zero sense whatsoever that they're not set up at at Senate. They're telling us we all have to work from home and they're not set up at all for senators to be able to send in an email and say the way they want to vote. Especially with the way that we have fucking tech right now. You and I, we're on Skype. You're telling me he can't Skype onto the Senate floor, be on C-SPAN and say his couple remarks about how we shouldn't be giving all this money to these uh, giant corporations that were headed downhill regardless of coronavirus. There's been talk, by the way, for months I've been seeing these articles about zombie debt corporations and how all like the, the next asset bubble is all in this corporate debt. That stuff coming undone has – I, I mean it was inevitable. It might be that industry shutting down and the coronavirus like gets them to that point where it's like, oh, we have no savings and we you know, we spent all of our debt. But that, that was coming no matter what. And th- that's the craziest thing about Rand Paul is like – so now he's just not allowed to weigh in or vote on this. Yeah, it is really – and of course Rand Paul, you know, he's get, he gets beat up in the press 
for this, and it's the same as the thing with um, the 9-11 first responders bill, he says the most reasonable thing. Like, he's not even hardcore in the way a lot of libertarians would want him to be, but he just goes, look, I'll pay for this, but, like, we're spending over four trillion a year. There's ton of it's wasted. Let's just like let's let's find the money in the budget to pay for this. And they're just you know, people get furious about that. But yeah, you're right. It's a very good point. Like like me and you can still figure out how to do our stupid podcast. Yet the fucking Senate, you're just like, well, I mean, if you're not there physically, how would we possibly know how you felt? <laughs> About this situation. I mean, it's like, you know, like they're still working on 1770s technology or something. The horse won't get here on time. We've got to vote now. I mean, if you're at home, we won't find out how you feel for three weeks at least. But, but, you know, right. Like, it's just it's so strange. Um, It's also one of the things that's interesting is that. So there's several different points about it. Number one, Rand Paul, um, he got tested only because well first off he's a senator so he might be you know able to get a test a little bit easier than some other people can but Rand Paul's had a you know lung condition over the last year because he was he was coward uh, that he was a victim of a cowardly attack by his neighbor who blindsided him he has a lung problem from that yeah he had a punctured lung and had Jeez. like had major problems after that uh, that attack. So he w- and you know he's meeting a whole lot of people, and I guess he was around someone who ended up testing positive. So he got a test just to be safe, but he's showing no symptoms to this to this day. So he ended up getting a test and 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 it was positive. So he went into self you know quarantine or whatever. Um, but it just shows you it's it's hard, and I think nobody really knows. Like we don't have a real gauge of like, well, how many people are there out there? Who are showing no symptoms who who have gotten this thing or have already beaten this thing we just we really don't know you know and it's um so that's one of the uh the elements of of the Rand paul thing uh the other the other thing is like you said it's you know it's this is the problem when you have like a, a senate that's basically you know for for every one a, a, a senator who might actually vote you know his conscious in an interesting way there is just 150, you know, members of Congress who are just garbage. So you lose the one guy who would have maybe made the point and now you're like, oh, great. So all these other people. Mitt Romney is now self-quarantining because he was around Rand Paul. Um, The other thing, dude, is just that I've seen so many. It's amazing. I I remember Tom Woods. I actually just got off the phone with Tom. I'm going to try to We're going to podcast soon with him. Um, But he uh, um, he said this years ago. And I remember it stuck with me because I thought maybe he was wrong about it when he said it. And then I just every like it was just proven to be correct. But I this because this was back in like this might have been in 2009 or something like that or 2010. He said uh, he goes, if the if the your average left winger has a choice between a principled neocon uh, between a principled libertarian or a neocon, they'll choose the neocon 10 out of 10 times. And you were, and I was kind of like, but that doesn't make any sense because like the, you know, left wing people agree with us on like the question of war and peace and the war on drugs and cronyism and, you know, like all of the corporate welfare. There's a lot of issues that we're together on. And what are the, the hell could they like about a neocon? Like they're, you know, those are the war criminals. The left hates them. And I was very naive at the time, but I believe that. And then you see it every time. But man, nothing pisses people off more than somebody who questions the welfare state or questions the government spending. Because, dude, the amount of just horrifically vile, like, hatred toward Rand Paul on Twitter, their people are just, like, saying they're thrilled that he has the virus and all this other shit. It's been, like, I don't know if you've seen any of it, but it's, like, it's eye-opening. Like, holy shit, man. People really hate this guy just for saying things like, you know, Maybe we shouldn't in debt the fucking the the country, you know, like maybe we should find the money somewhere else in the budget. Seems pretty wild to me. I have not seen that, but that, you know, all the every time there's an uproar on Twitter and people are nasty, it's always entertaining. So I'll have to check that yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, that's that's for sure. You know what uh, I'm kind of amused by with uh, the current bailout plan, because it includes that the Fed is going to be buying up uh, corporate debt, like directly buying up corporate debt. Now. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the mainstream criticisms of government running a deficit and running debt 
is that they say that there's going to be a crowding out of private investment. I think that's like even like amongst the Keynesian yes. economics, they go, here's the biggest risk of us lending money to the government. You're going to crowd out private investment. But then they always go, oh, well, we don't really have a track record of that. So it's not a problem. Now, here's what's interesting. When government now needs to go buy corporate debt, you're essentially saying there is no private demand for this debt. And so what well, what happened? It must have gotten crowded out. What happened to all the funds that would have gone into these? Now, obviously, there are issues that they must be overextended and we've created a bubble. But th like the very argument against kind of government deficit is you're going to crowd out private investment and government by having to buy those bonds directly shows that it has crowded it out. So you, you see like that. It doesn't make any sense that you'd extend the exact policy where you're saying, hey, the, the worst thing that can happen from this is we crowd out private investment. Oh, there's no private investment. So we're going to do more of this. Right. Right. No, no, I, I completely agree with that. And it's it's a uh, but but somehow. Right. Like th this is a weird thing where you realize that even by the Keynesian logic, these proposals are kind of crazy. And the real thing that's crazy that any Keynesian should say, right, that that e even like, again, completely, even if you completely reject the Austrian school of economic thought and you and you were a complete Keynesian, you should. And, and this is what they you know, we've talked about this before on the show, but. You should have said, oh, you know what we did that was wrong? What was really, really wrong is that for the last five years, we should have had drastic cuts in government spending and higher interest rates because the whole Keynesian philosophy is basically that the idea is that in smooth it out. Yes. Save the surplus. Right. So in a recession demand is down right because people have less money to spend and so people produce more but it's just because demand is down and so I, w here's what we can do we can inject more money into the economy which rises demand and then people will produce more to meet that demand and you smooth out the economy and then when you're in a good you know in a good economic swing then you cut the money out of the system to pay down the deficit and to even things out from when you injected it into there, which is even in theory is very problematic. But the real problem is that in practice, or another real problem is that in practice, that never seems to happen during the good times. So the, Donald Trump has been br basically the argument for the last two years has been Donald Trump saying, this economy is so great and it's because of me that it's great. And then the the Democratic Keynesian response has been, no, 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 this is because of Obama and that's why the economy is so great. And it's only really been like a few people like me and you, you know, and Peter Schiff and Tom Woods and people like that who are like, you're both wrong. The economy is not great. This is all a bubble. But they've just been arguing over who gets credit for the economy being great. And, they, and at the same time, we had record high government spending and... The interest rates weren't as low as this, but they never went up to anything approaching normal interest rates. And so now you're like, oh, shit, we are hit with a real legit hard time. And there's not that much you can even do because we've we've already had these policies. So all of these things are, you know, it's 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 shaky, even based on their own theory. However, I think all of those theories are wrong. And the Austrian free market understanding of the economy is much more important. And I think that, you know, if, if we're right uh, about our understanding of the economy, then bringing interest rates back down to zero and injecting all of this money into the markets, this is going to be a disaster because it's going to make it's going to compound the problem. It's going to make it even worse. The problem with bringing interest rates down to zero is that you you send the the absolute wrong signal through prices. I, I think that Austrians are the only ones, the Austrian economists, were the only ones who really ever understood this. And I think it comes from, the, like, like, I think it all derives from an understanding of what prices are to begin with. Like, I, I, I think it all comes from the subjective theory of value, right? Like, there's all these other th theories of, of what, how how value is created. But the Austrians understood that basically they're, they're, the Misesian, or it, maybe it goes even before him to like Manger, but their understanding was that it's like, well, look, value is subjective. And the fact that we have an economy at all kind of proves that. The fact that we have trade at all kind of proves that value is subjective. Like you value something more than I value it, and I value something else more, and that's why we'll trade those things. Because you want one more than I want the other, and that's why we'll trade them back and forth. And value is, you know, in the same, just 
to take any weird example, but you know, somebody might really like orange juice and somebody hates orange juice. So to one person that's valuable, to the other person it's not. There is no objective standard of, of value. Um, and so once you realize that, you realize that a price is a signal. And, and it obviously has to do with supply and demand, but it's like it's a signal to how much people value this, you know, um, given how much is available and how, mu how much it costs to produce and things like that. So all prices are signals. This is why there's a, there's a major problem with price controls in general. It's why price controls lead to shortages or oversupplies of things like there's a, and that interest rates are, in fact, the price of money. And what a low interest rate indicates to businessmen out there is that there's high savings. And so now is the time to invest that money, because what is it when somebody's saving a whole bunch of money? That's basically them saying, well, I'm deferring consumption to the future. Right. Like if you save money, if you take a thousand dollars and you save it, you put it in your bank account, you're like, I could go spend a thousand dollars today, but I choose to save that money and consume in the future. So you have more savings. The interest rate goes down. And now uh, producers, businessmen are producing for the future where you're because you've been told there's this consumer coming up in the future. So it all kind of like aligns and makes sense. But when you have no savings rate and people are spending everything they've got and then you bring interest rates down, it's like, well, now people are producing for the future, but who's going to be the consumer in the future? It, it throws everything out of whack. So it's actually the worst thing you could be doing, even if you wanted to help people right now. The interest rate should be way, way higher. So you know, we'll uh, see all that. 100%. And I actually never thought of it quite in those terms where you're signaling, hey, there's going to be a consumer in the future. Another issue is whenever government comes in and they say, listen, we're going to take care of everyone. Like, let's take health care, health care. They go, we want everyone to have health care and we're going to get everyone the best health care because you deserve it. So they say that. But in reality, you have rationing because they can't possibly provide it to everybody. It doesn't happen. So like they pretend you'd be better off if there was a lesser care that actually was a little bit more efficient and everyone can have. But that's not the way government comes in. They go in and go, we're going to get the best thing because everyone deserves the best thing and they can't possibly provide it. When you have a 0% interest rate, you're essentially doing the exact same thing where you go 0%. I'm like, amazing. So I can go start a business tomorrow with a 0% in. No, there's rationing. I don't have access to that. You know, as access to it, the biggest and most powerful companies in the world, they can get a 0% interest rate. It does nothing for me. Right. It's, it's like another good, which essentially the government gets to distribute with rationing. And then the people who get it are the ones who are the least deserving. Yeah, no, that, that that's absolutely right. And all of these things, I mean, this is all, and you can see the handwriting on the wall already. This is going to be, you know, like we've said a lot of times that, so Bernie Sanders and, and his ilk, right? They do make somewhat of a fair point um, when they go, look in our society how some people have so much and other people have so little. Which even if it was a pure free market, which, you know, obviously it's not, but that would still be a point to be made. I mean, if you lived in a society where some people are billionaires and some people are sleeping under a bridge at night, it might, you know, if you if you're like a decent person and have some humanity in you, you might go, man, that's kind of crazy. And what can we do to kind of like help that person out? Now, it's a little bit more of a difficult, you know, discussion than most left wingers will make you think because it's not so clear that it's just the only problem is that like, you know, like if we just took a bunch of money from that billionaire and gave it to the guy living under the street, he's, he might end up like shitting on it and wiping his ass with it because he might be a little crazy. There might be more to this than just giving someone money. But regardless of that, there is a problem with income inequality in the country. And a lot of times I think guys like me and you wouldn't just say like like your standard Ben Shapiro Republican would say something like, well, in inequality, like we don't care about equality of outcome. We just care about equality of opportunity or something like that, you know, but someone like me or you might actually go a little bit further and be like, well, no, this whole game is rigged for the powerful. And that's part of the reason why you have such grotesque inequality is that you have a four and a half trillion dollar state that is rigged to keep the rich getting richer and screw over the poor, like at every inch of it. 
Um, you know, like whether, you know, you pick any field you want to, whether it's the banking sector and you go, it's completely rigged for the big banks. If, if the, the, you know, the whole regulatory state is completely rigged for big business, the whole patent industry is completely rigged for big pharmaceutical companies. You know, like this is, this is why they're able to get these government patents and then charge, you know, the average person five times as much as, as they charge other people for these prescription drugs. It's disgusting. So it's not as if there isn't something to the inequality you know, argument. It's just easier to make the Bernie Sanders case than it is to make me or your argument for it. But you see this coming now. This is just going to get a lot worse because, of course, everything they're doing so far is going to bail out big companies. And here's what's crazy about the bailing out big companies is, one, you're socializing losses. Like, I, I know libertarians aren't going to agree with me on this, but, like, if you're already bailing out a company, yes, you should be able to cap the executive's pay. Yes, you should be able to go back and claw it back. You've already basically created a – like, it's now socialized. You just socialize the losses. So now they get to, to have the entire gains. Maybe it should just be a government entity at that point. If you're socializing the losses, wait, so we just get the shit part of it? And then the other thing that just makes no sense is – No, and I just – listen, gonna, I, hold on. I, yeah. And I want you to finish – I want you to finish your point. But just to be clear on this before you get the backlash – it's not that Rob's saying, like, this is the policy you want. You're just saying amongst two evil policies, which one is kind of the lesser evil, if I understand you correctly? That yeah. it's just like, if you're well, going to bail out companies. The Fed itself is an interesting question in that regard, that if you're going to have some entity that can just print money, should it be private banks or should it at least be the government? Now, you and I might argue that if it was the government, maybe it'd be even more destructive but between those two things where you just have p private individuals that have the power of the government, I would make the argument maybe it should at least be nationalized. But we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. Well, I will. Hold on. We don't have to go down yeah. that rabbit hole. But where here's what I will agree with you on is that it at least should be audited. It at least yes. should be transparent in some way. To the You shouldn't get all the secrecy of a private company with all the power of the state. So I, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. But anyway, can, continue. I'm sorry. Um. Ah, uh, shit, I might have lost my train of thought. Oh, no, here's what I was going to say. Bailing out companies doesn't even make sense because, like, let's say the economy is coming to, like, a total halt and we're saying the Fed's going to, you know, print $2 trillion. So at least if you printed $2 trillion and you handed it to individuals, we would figure out what are essential goods and we would start rewarding companies that are good at getting us essential goods. Or you'd at least force companies to create goods and services. When you just bail out the company, like... If nobody wants to travel, is it that important that we have an airline industry? Not really. Like, think about how many irrelevant, like, or look at it this way. If all, we're all germaphobes now, and you and I never want to go to a movie theater again, is it important for society that we have movie theaters? Not really. You know what I mean? And if you start looking down some of the list of companies that are probably going to get a bailout, it just doesn't make sense. Why would you prop up a company if they have a service that nobody wants or needs? Yeah, no, 100%. But that's not going to stop them from doing it. But I, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and I also do agree with you that it's like, you know, you get into this weird territory where a lot of times, particularly libertarians, like to be um, uh, philosophically pure. And I love that about libertarians. Like, thank God, they're the only group of people who are even concerned with that, it seems like to me. Um, and, and I get it. You want to be philosophically pure. But sometimes we're in a situation where we're stuck between two bad decisions. This is more or less the, the my whole point on immigration and what it's always been is like if you're conceding that the government controls the borders, well, we're in a bad situation no matter what. And maybe one bad is better than the other bad, even though neither are pure libertarian answers. But if you're talking about bailing out the big banks, which are, let's get real, only quasi private companies to begin with you know like for people who say the um the federal reserve is independent which is what they claim right they're independent of the federal government yet the chairman's appointed by the president i mean imagine there was like a, a any company like imagine mcdonald's and the ceo and the board were appointed by the president and then they went but we're an independent company from the government I think we'd all be like, well, you're not that independent. You're certainly not independent in the way any other company is from the federal government, right? And the and the big banks are all basically just subsidiaries of the Federal Reserve. So if you're going to say we're going to bail out these big banks, let's say scenario A is we're going to bail out the big banks 
and they can still give their executives $50 million bonuses and go buy fucking yachts and party it up. Or scenario B is we're going to bail out the big banks, but you get no bonuses for the executives. Okay, well, I prefer scenario B to scenario A. Now, obviously, I prefer to any of that not bailing out the big banks, but I still think it's reasonable to say within these, you know, if these are the choices, we could still say, well, one might be more grotesque than the other. Um, but that's not what's going to happen. They're going to bail out a lot of these different companies. And and on top of that, just from how hard hit this economy is going to be, um, who's going to be more likely to survive it? It's not going to be the small and mid-level companies. It's going to be the big companies. That's who's going to who's going to be left standing after all this is done. So you're going to have a monetary policy that is basically just a handout to the fucking rich. This is the thing that's fucking crazy to me. When you see the, 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 it's like so funny that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump both are happy with zero percent interest rates. Like that's what they want. Now, Donald Trump, you understand a little bit more because he's the guy in right now. So what president who's in right now doesn't want zero percent interest rates, you know? Um, and Bernie Sanders, he he should have more of a problem because he's out. But the thing that none of them realize is that the reason they both exist the reason they're both popular is because of 0% interest rates. That's that's the heart of this whole thing. And I know so many, but so many of the people on the populist right and the populist left don't even realize that. They don't even know that. But that's what you, that's you, your whole thing is a response to that. It's because in 2008, we brought the interest rates down to zero and we lived with 0% interest rates for a fucking decade. OK, and basically what zero percent interest rates are is it's the federal government through the independent organization of the Federal Reserve saying, hey, fuck you, savers, fuck you, families, fuck you, anybody on a fixed income. This economy belongs to the speculators. This economy belongs to the Wall Street connected elite. That's who gets to fucking rake in the profits while you guys all struggle to get by. That's what an economy with 0% interest rates looks like. And then people see the result of all of that and populism starts rising because they're like, well, fuck this elite. This is bullshit. And it's just funny to watch them like kind of cheer this on. And you're like, oh, dude, do you guys even realize that we're going to start another round of this now? And holy shit, if it looks like this already, what's it going to look like in five years? And, and that's, you know, it's so funny that so many people are like, um, you know, dancing on the, the supposed corpse of libertarianism, you know, where people are like, ah, you know, and I, and I get where people who are like, you know, not looking at it more deeply could be like, well, yeah, I mean, are you saying, I mean, if this virus is such a, a bad thing, are you saying you should just have the right to go out and infect other people with the virus or something like that? And of course, people need welfare and they need checks now. I, I can kind of wrap my head around why people would feel that way. But man, I look at this and go, there has never been a more important moment for somebody to be pointing out for somebody to be going like, whoa, we are going down a dangerous path right now of just government tyranny, government created economic collapse. And someone needs to be pointing out like how dangerous this shit is. Also, and and it, somehow it, it falls to me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem right. But along those lines of what you're saying, you really want to reset here. We need to educate people about personal responsibility and savings. That's what we need a new framework for is personal responsibility and savings. Now, if you're going to bail out every major corporation so that goods and services that we don't need are still the core of the American economy, you also need to somehow give people enough money that they can go on flights that they don't need to take, movies that they don't need to see. Think about how much excess there is in our economy that is being driven by excess spending, which all comes from the Fed. You, you kind of see the picture that I'm painting here? Yeah. It's like if you really want to reset, what you need is people who are going to be responsible for themselves and save and be ready for these kind of disasters that when disaster strikes, like you said in the last episode we did, you don't have a parent who can't feed his kid a single meal without the school. 
like th- that shouldn't be. And so, but you're you're propagating the system, which is well, we need to bail out all these companies because these services need to exist. Well, now we got to figure out a way for people to be able to be able to spend money on that. All right, well, here's your credit card. Great, it's more of the same. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I um, I'm personally going back and forth a little bit between what's freaking me out more, um, the fi- the financial stuff or the monetary policy stuff that's going on, and then just the blatant government overreach of like, look, like maybe you think, like here's the thing, right? Even if you think this virus is so bad that even though we believed in things like freedom, and I don't even just mean freedom the way me or you might mean it. I mean freedom the way the layman person just goes, you know, like if you go to a bar and you're like, uh, uh, you go in, like me and you go into a bar and you go up to the, um, you know, the bar and we're like, hey, uh, are, you know, are these seats taken? Or like, hey, can we can we sit here? And someone goes, that's eh, free country. You know, just like in the casual way that people go, yeah, well, it's yeah. a free country. We believe in freedom, right? I mean, don't we? The way that just... Joe Sixpack believes in freedom. Um, maybe this virus is so bad that we got to get rid of freedom the way we think of it. Like, you can't go to work because you could spread this around to a lot of people. And the government has a right to come in and tell you to stay in your home. And the government has the right to decide what is essential and what is not essential. And what is that? You know, they just have a right to tell you that. They have a right to fucking tell you, get back in your home. That's it. Um, okay. Even if you believe that's necessary for... to contain this virus don't you think there's also a concern with that that to to defeat this one evil like that we might be sending in the bees to take out the bears or something like that and that after the bears are gone we may have this other problem which is the bees that we have to deal with you know like isn't there something to be said that it's like we're all just going to accept that the, the fucking government can tell factories what they need to produce that, you know, Andrew Cuomo is getting on TV and, and just saying, he's like, hey, if you're a retired medical, he, he basically said he was like, if you're a, a retired, um, you know, like a, a medical worker, a medical professional, um, he goes, I'm asking you to come back to work. And he goes, I'm not forcing you to, but just so you know, I could force you to. That's more or less what he said, that I, we could write There's, legislation to force you to come back to work. Does that not creep anyone else out? It, it, it's your what you said it a thousand times, but you hear the way Andrew Cuomo talks, and it just sounds so mob-like. Where he's like, I'm not forcing you, but I'm telling you, it would be a really good idea if you turned over your factory. It'd be a really good idea if yeah. you did that. It's a shame. It, there, there, it's a shame if I – it would be a real shame if I had to force you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there's a real flippancy to uh, what I'm hearing some of these people say, like, listen, yeah, we're forcing factories to produce things that they otherwise wouldn't have, but it's a crisis. So, of course, well, that's not just an of course. That's really something that we should debate and talk about. Also, just the concept that there's a factory that could be producing equipment or services right now that would turn them a profit. But they're just going, eh, no, nah, we're good. We don't really want to make money. I got this factory here, and it could produce masks, but no, nah, I don't really like making masks. It was never my dream in life. And you know what? I'm just going to sit at home. I'll sit at home. Why, why would I make masks that would make me money? Why would that? There's no way that's true. There's no way that, like, the, I know they're talking about taking over the Jacob Javits Center. There's no way that the Jacob Javits Center wouldn't rent it to them. Like, so now there's a demand. Like, they can't run any fucking expos for the next couple months. They're telling me right. that if. They couldn't sign a contract that said that they were liable to, you know, restore it to the condition that it's in now. They wouldn't want to rent that space out. Like the the idea that government has to come in and bully these industries and that if they weren't just free to make money, they wouldn't get us to the same point is just absurd. Yeah. And it's very hard to weigh out. And this is part of the reason why a free market economy is superior to any other model is that it's very hard to know everything and to know what everybody should be producing. And, you know, th- this is one of the things that I see right now that uh, I find really alarming is that you go like, oh, OK, so I understand where you could look at one factor or one dynamic and go, well, this is going to be the best thing to help with the spread of this coronavirus, or this would be the best move to get ventilators, to create more ventilators or something like that. But the truth is that a modern society has 
millions of different variables, and it's very hard for people to weigh out all of the variables. So let me ask you this, or let me just pose a question. I'm not asking you. It's kind of like a rhetorical just, just I was ready to question answer. out there. You, well, maybe you can answer, but no, the, the, my point is almost that no one can answer this question. Yeah. But let's say, just hypothetically speaking, let's say that the coronavirus, if not contained, would lead to 2 million people dying, okay? Let's say 2 million people, they would predominantly be older and people who have some type of, you know, underlying condition, but some of them wouldn't, some of them would be healthy and some of them would be young people and whatever, right? Just for the sake of argument, maybe it's it's more, maybe it's less, but let's just say if uncontained, it would be 2 million people. What level of destroying the economy would be worth preventing that? Now, fucking Cuomo said the other day, which is just, oh, God, it drives me crazy. He goes, listen, I don't know if these measures will help, but if these measures could save one life, then they'll be worth it, which is just the dumbest fucking statist thing to say, which sounds nice to fucking somebody who's either stupid or just hasn't thought about any of this stuff at all. But that's actually bullshit. That's bullshit. We don't, we don't, no, no country with even just the average Joe six pack, of course you can sit here, it's a free country attitude, actually thinks that we shut something down to save one life. Here's a good example of that. I, I'm, I bet one person a year dies of electrocution. Maybe we shouldn't have electricity. Well, that's right. That's that's exactly right. And 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 then, of course, with that's a great example with electricity. Then you go, wait, 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 but how many people die for us not having electricity? Or how many people's lives are fucking ruined for us not having electricity? And then you realize it's not as simple as saying, oh, let me save one life. Now it's it's adding what's actually better than the other one and, and maybe even what's consistent with people having some semblance of freedom. But yeah, you could just, you could, if you believed that, you would make, um, you know, gas stoves illegal, you would make swimming pools illegal, you would make fucking cars illegal, like all of these things. Think about that, right? If, if you look at uh, the amount of, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but the amount of uh, fatalities due to cars, uh, due to car crashes every year, right? Well, if you go, well, I mean, I'm, I'm saying we should ban all cars and, and trucks too. You know, ban all of them. And if that saves one life, then isn't it worth it? Well, you'd go, well, no, 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 because actually you need trucks to bring like food to supermarkets. And a lot of people are going to die if you don't have that happening. So it's not as simple as, oh, we just saved one life. We shut everything down. And so my question is, even if it is a couple million people, what is worth that that loss? Like, it, like is it worth if, if you were to say, if let's say, maybe I'm wrong and I'm exaggerating, but let's say I'm right and we're going to send America into the second Great Depression, that's going to, that, that's not just like, you know, numbers on a board. This is real human beings' lives. This is something that's going to really ruin, you know, the, it's going to make life a whole different thing for future generations. And, um, I, you know, it seems like there's no consideration of that. Like, it seems like nobody's having a serious conversation about, well, how long can we possibly do this? How much can we possibly destroy this economy? Um, th and at what point will we go, that's just not worth it? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, hindsight's going to be 2020, but they're going to realize when this thing all played out that they probably should have just had everyone under the age of 55 working, told you, hey, don't go home to your parents or don't go home to your grandparents until we have immediate testing day of. And they should have just let the system basically play itself out. But who knows? I, I, I mean, it all comes down to the fact that I, I think I said this on the last episode, and I think this is accurate. We can't handle 3% of the population being sick at the same time, which is insane. That, and that's basically what they're playing out is like there, there's not enough hospital beds or resources for three percent of people to be sick at the same time. And unless everyone stays home, uh, we're going to hit that. So I, I yeah, don't know. No, they, you're... They like the, 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 this fucking situation is insane, dude. No, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. And it really says something. It does say something for sure about the whole uh, the 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 problems that already existed in our whole healthcare apparatus the whole healthcare industry and something about the whole you know like um you, you see like all of these buildings you know that are like built um you know if, if there's buildings that are built in florida they're built for they're hurricane proof any of the new buildings that are built and the ones in la are earthquake proof and you know like all these things like you prepare 
for the worst case scenario. But then to see, um, you know, people at the CDC being like, well, we were never prepared to control a disease. And you're like, but what? I mean, what the fuck was the point? I thought that was your whole point of being was to be prepared to control a disease. They're like, oh my God. I mean, we never thought we'd actually have to control a disease in a central way. I mean, like what, you know, and, and that's, and, and, you know, to be fair, cause I, obviously I love to beat up on the government, but it also does, you know, it shows you all throughout the society how much personal responsibility has just been destroyed where it's like, you know, if people are, you know, like you see Bernie Sanders and all these people handling about how people need help immediately. And you're like, man, this, this really says something about our culture. It says something about the policies, the government, and how much that's affected the entire culture that people weren't prepared for, you know, um, for a week. They weren't prepared for two weeks. It's so funny. The central disease center, we're at the center to let you know that there's nothing we can do and you're all fucked. <laughs> yeah, more or less, right. And, and, and the number one thing they got to do is fucking get rid of their rules. You know, Donald yeah. Trump was, was touting that drug the other day and he said the FDA has approved it, we're ready to go. And then the FDA comes out to go, no, 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 you're wrong. We have not approved that yet. Like, they don't even think it's embarrassing to go, no, 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 we're not going to let you experiment on this yet. It's like, well, if you're telling me this is a global pandemic where we need to shut down the whole goddamn country, maybe it's time to start experimenting a little bit, right? Maybe maybe we should be allowed to fucking do that. Um, all right, brother. Well, we're uh, we're, we're going to wrap up there. I wanted to uh, uh, to get you guys another another uh, fireside conversation with, uh, with Robbie the Fire Bernstein, the king and of the cops. By the way. For future ones, I have a good microphone. I lost the cord because I'm an idiot. And then I ordered a new one, but I sent it to Queens. So it, it, not too far in the future. No, but that was before all this shit went down because I, I, I saw the uh, writing on the wall that I needed an internet mic. So just know that the audio quality might suck on this one and the last one, but in the future, I'll fix that. In the future, you'll get it better. All right. Very good. Uh, uh, glad to hear that. All right, buddy. Well, continue to be safe. Have fun, have fun up there, and uh, we'll uh, we'll do another one of these soon. We'll check in soon. All right. Oh, and go listen to uh, Run Your Mouth. Go check out Run Your Mouth and follow Rob on Twitter at Robbie the Fire. And uh, yep, thanks for uh, listening. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.